What are the seven key questions that you need to ask yourself before starting your own business as an academic? Stick around and find out here on this episode of Navigating Academia. What's up everybody? My name is Dr. Jay Phoenix Singh and I want to welcome you to this special episode of Navigating Academia, your leading source for guidance on how to be able to advance your career in academia. As always, I appreciate the love, so please do like and share this video, subscribe to our channel, hit that bell so that you get notified whenever we upload new videos, and comment below. You can follow me at these social media accounts. So let's jump right in. You're an academic interested in starting your own company. I've been there myself and I know there's that unique combination of excitement and ambivalence, especially if you have no business background at all and you ignored your parents' guidance when you were an undergraduate to be able to do a minor in business, to be able to learn things like accounting, basic finance and bookkeeping, uh, sales and marketing, so on and so forth. You're not quite sure where to actually start. Should you be an LLC? Should you be an S corporation? Uh, you know, where should should you even start? It can be really daunting. It can be really challenging. And so what I want to do here for you is to give you seven key questions that you need to ask yourself before you take this plunge. And my hope is that it's going to help you with your framework in terms of deciding whether or not this is something that you want to do. And if it is something you want to do, it's going to be able to give you things to think about to be able to make sure that you have a successful launch and the best experience possible. Be sure to stick around for all seven because it's going to give you a really comprehensive frame of what to do and questions to ask. So let's go ahead and get started with question number one, which is what kind of a business do you want to start? I would argue that there's, of course, so many types of businesses, uh, but really there are two in terms of your conceptualization for today. The first one is what I would refer to as an exit-focused business. This is a startup where the goal is to be able to achieve what they call the hockey stick. The hockey stick basically refers to how much money, how much revenue the company has relative to time. The idea is obviously that whenever you're starting a new business, you're going to have to put money in. And this either means from your own pocket, from friends and family, from you know seed capital investors, angel investors, usually not venture investors, not when it comes to you know this level of things, uh, just when you're getting started. But Money has to come from somewhere, and that money that you have initially, you're gonna burn through it because you gotta build those products and services. You gotta make that website, hire those 1099 contractors. You know, you gotta get the right people on your team and get things built. But if you do it and you use that money wisely and you follow a business plan and you do everything with integrity and you build some high quality stuff, hopefully that's going to start selling. You're going to recruit, uh, recoup that initial investment and just make more and more money over time. That trajectory is what people want to see. It's called YOY or year over year growth. It is critical that you establish this as fast as possible because when it comes to achieving a multiple upon exit, which means that let's say the gross revenue of your company is $100,000 to pick a nice round number, and you want to sell the company after a couple of years, you don't want just $100,000. You want to establish that the trajectory of that company is such that, yeah, this year it's $100,000, but with new leadership coming in and putting a bunch more money into it and really exploding this thing out in terms of other people getting involved, etc., this could go from $100,000 to a million dollars in three years. And if you've established that hockey stick, then it's something where they're likely to give you a multiple, which means instead of valuing the company at $100,000, they're going to value the company at, let's say, $500,000, which is a five-time multiple. So that's what they refer to it as. 
So if that's your goal is to be able to, let's say that as an academic you're making 75K a year and you do that for let's say five years, you know, it's a great salary, certainly, and you can do exceedingly well. If you have an exit focused business, during those five years, you may be able to take some salary from the company, probably not a ton, depends how well the company's doing. But the goal is to flip the company within usually seven to 10 years. Uh, my last company I flipped in three and a half years. I do not recommend that. I was working literally seven days a week and in three and a half years I took literally 13 days off. Uh, and that means I worked every weekend all year round and 13 days, that's all I really took, right? So, which is really brutal. It is brutal on your life. Uh, so I don't recommend using that strategy. Just take a little while longer. Instead of five years, take seven to 10 years. And that's really par for the course in terms of startups. So that's an exit focused business. The goal is to never hit a plateau. You never wanna be in the hockey stick and then all of a sudden it just starts to taper off and then growth stagnates. If that happens, then anybody who's gonna buy the company Sometimes they're gonna look at it and say, yeah, I could put resources in and break that plateau. Other people are going to say, listen, these guys, they put in a lot of resources, they're putting in all these man hours, and they're still not breaking through this plateau. I think that it's basically hit the point that it's gonna hit, and yeah, it could be income generating, you know, producing ordinary income, but it's not something that I'm really interested in getting involved with at a multiple. So that's important and it means that you're gonna have to bust your butt incredibly, incredibly hard. Now the second kind of business, you're still gonna have to bust your butt, right? And it's still gonna be something where, you know, it's gonna be at least three to five years until you actually start making, you know, any real, you know, money such that it would actually impact your quality of life. But this is what's called a lifestyle business. And a lifestyle business is one where you essentially founded this company and are running this company to supplement, or hope, it depends on what you want, make that your sole source of income if you can build it to be large enough. That is what's called a lifestyle company. Now keep in mind that if you're doing a lifestyle company, usually you're going to keep your job in terms of uh, you're not gonna get any investors usually. If you do get investors, they're gonna be a very specific type of investor. So these are going to be individuals who are interested in getting ordinary income. They're, they're not assuming that they're gonna get a multiple on their investment. If they put $20,000 in, let's say, as pre-seed capital to be able to you know, help you survive just yourself for a few months of the year, you know, let's say four months, you know, you've got a, a burn rate, as it's called, of $5,000 a month to be able to you know, pay all fees associated with running the business, fine, they're going to fund it, but they're going to assume that they're going to get ordinary income back on that as opposed to, I'm putting in 20K, and then that is going to not only appreciate, but then when it's flipped, I'm going to get a ton more money. So, you know, depending on the startup that people put money into, keep in mind that that money could go to other places, right? You know, this money could go into real estate, the money could go into the stock market, it could go into bonds, it can go into so many different places. So you really have to have a compelling value proposition to get individuals to even put money in in the first place. But if it's a lifestyle company, the goal isn't to flip it. The goal is not to get that hockey stick. Obviously, you wanna get as much money out of the company as you can, but you're not doing it so that in seven to 10 years, you can sell it for a multiple. You're doing it because it's a passion. It's something that makes you wake up every morning and be excited about your life and what you're doing. Uh, and there's really nothing better than that. And also, if you can help other people, I always say that there's nothing better than doing well, financially, by doing good. If you can achieve those two twin goals, uh, I would say that you're a very blessed person. Question number two to ask yourself, and this is a very serious question, is why do you want to start a business in the first place? Now there's three things that I usually hear, and so I'm just going to mention them and kind of dispel these as quickly as possible. And by the way, these are all things that I thought. So this isn't just me you know, talking anecdotally or talking cynically, this is speaking from experience as somebody who started his own company in his mid-20s uh, to be able to achieve these different goals and uh, it was not what I thought it was going to be, I'll tell you that right now, even though now I love it and I've started new companies. Uh, so the first one is, I wanna be a millionaire, this is what people say, and starting my own business, I'm gonna become a millionaire. 
So let's say that you start your company in your 20s. So, you know, the classic adage is that nine out of 10 startups fail within the first five years. Uh, and also only 17% of individuals start their company in their 20s, have CEOs in their 20s. So because of that, I essentially had the likelihood of my success being approximately 1.3%. Uh, and I always say that when it comes to starting a business, and I'll, other, I'll make other videos on this channel talking about business, uh, but you have to understand that at the end of the day, y there's two things that you need. Uh, you need naivete and you need confidence. If you have those two things, regardless of the age that you're at right now, you can be in your 20s, you can be in your 60s, you need both of those things. And I wouldn't call it arrogance, I would just say confidence, insofar as believing that if you develop certain products and services that you you would buy that other people would want to buy them as well you need to be really confident of that and you need to just say to yourself and have the mindset you know i i have an exceedingly low probability of success very very low probability of success but doesn't mean that i can't make it I can make it. I can be one of those people who actually achieves that goal. If you don't have that mindset going in, don't even start the company in the first place. Uh, it's going to be a huge pain in your butt and it's not going to be something where you're going to have a positive experience. You got to get your mindset right before you jump into one of these things. So that's number one. Number two is people telling me, I want to be my own boss. You know, they have a manager they don't like, they have a department chair that they're not fond of, they have a dean that's giving them a hard time. Maybe the university that they're at, they just say, ah, you know, it's too conservative or it's too liberal or I don't like the students, they're, you know, not high caliber enough, whatever it is, the, you know, the facilities aren't nice enough, whatever. But people say, I want to be my own boss. What you need to know is that if you start your own company, every customer you have is your boss. You don't have one boss, you have thousands of bosses now and you are accountable to all of them and there is no shield above you. At least when you're working for somebody else, if you have a boss or a supervisor, etc., somebody's gonna be giving you positive reinforcement, patting you on the back, saying good job, hopefully if you have a good boss, and is going to, if there's any kind of flack that you end up receiving, it's going to go to them first, right? It's not gonna come straight down on you unless somebody's throwing you under the bus, which does happen every now and again, it's unfortunate. I'm lucky to have not experienced that too many times, even though it does happen. But this is why, and that's one of the reasons why people usually say I want to be my own boss. But you're really not. You're really not your own boss. Everybody else is your boss, all the customers. You're going to have people working for you as well, and you're going to have to take all the flack before it gets to them. Uh, it is a very difficult situation. This is something I always think about. You know, the other literature that I'm very involved with is social psychology and relationships and dating and attraction and these things. And everybody always talks about this idea of an alpha uh, in something like, let's say, chimpanzees, et cetera, or, you know, great apes. And interestingly, if you actually take a look at the research that's been done, the kind of bio biological research and chemical research uh, that's been done on alphas is that you see their corticosteroid levels are some of the highest in the entire you know tribe that they're living within and their entire pack and you see that the best place to be is not the alpha it's the people in second and third and fourth command etc you don't want to be towards the end of the pack but being the top dog is insanely stressful so everybody always says i want to be alpha i want to be alpha it is not a great place to be in the wild in terms of your social status. And again, it's the same thing being your own boss. You need to know that and really consider it because a lot of people don't. And finally, people tell me, I want to set my own hours. If I don't want to wake up every day until 10 o'clock or noon, or I want to go to the gym every morning or every afternoon and work from home in my pajamas, whatever it is, awesome. I want to set my own hours. I can tell you right now that that's not going to happen. You're going to have more flexibility to an extent, but your hours go from being eight to five, whatever it is, to 24 seven. You are going to be on call to your employees, to your customers all the time. You can forget about the concept of free time. You can carve it out for yourself, right? I think that's very important. But especially the first couple of years, if you make the decision that I'm only going to work from 8 to 5 every day, I'm going to have that work-life balance, da 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 you're going to go really slow 
in your startup. And I can tell you right now that that can be the death knell for a huge number of startups that I've seen in the past. You wanna make sure that you're exploding out of the gate. And that means making huge sacrifices for a couple of years. Whether that be financial sacrifices, whether that be social sacrifices, there's a lot of things you're gonna to have to give up to get this job done. If it was easy, if it was enjoyable, you know, all the time, everybody would be doing it, and they don't. Entrepreneurs are really weird. They're a very unique group of people, uh, and you know, I'm very proud to call myself one of those individuals. And when I say weird, what I mean is that always remember that 90% of people out there are very happy being average. Uh, they don't think that they're average, uh, but in this one particular regard, when it comes to work, right, they're average. They, they just, they wanna go to a job and get their paycheck and come home and do whatever they want. And there is nothing wrong with that whatsoever. And these individuals deserve just as much respect as entrepreneurs. But entrepreneurs are a unique breed. And if you are willing to suffer for a period of time, it could literally be half a decade that you are just suffering, making no money, working 24-7. You know, your paycheck is going to other people in your organization to be able to make sure they get paid and they can eat because you're the leader. You gotta make sure your employees are taken care of and your 1099 contractors are getting paid and that you're putting money back into research and development and building new products and services. This is a brutal process. Some people literally call it the journey through hell. And you need to know that. Doesn't mean you shouldn't do it, but I want you to be prepared for what is most likely going to happen. Uh, and this is like across the board. I have never run into somebody. It's almost like getting into grad school. Everybody gets into grad school and they say to themselves, you know, oh, there's gonna be the best years of my life and da 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 da. And then it's incredibly challenging. Same thing with starting a company. Question number three to ask yourself is what is the impact of having this company going to be on your academic commitments? If you're planning on both being a professor or in academia and at the same time running your own independent thing, first of all, you should find out if you can even do that. Because there's some universities, some departments that that's explicitly say, you cannot do this independently. You cannot have your own independent uh, company while you're doing this. Some universities let you run companies through the university which is you know rare but you do see cases of that I've seen it myself but let's say that they do allow you to do it uh, think about your academic commitments think about the number of publications you're able to churn out the speed with which you're able to do it and the quality of those publications when you're spending all of your time on academia relative to when you're going to be spreading yourself more thin in that regard solely because you're working on a company. And think about it, even if you've got a side hustle, you got a lifestyle company, you're doing it after work, obviously you're working longer hours. That's gonna impact you at your primary job. And don't get into this thinking that you, know, you can be all things to all people and do it all with the same quality. Because even if you can for a brief period of time, you're going to burn out and that is not a good thing. The second thing to take into consideration in terms of academics is the time and emotional energy you have to be able to do things like serving on committees. And here I don't just mean committees within your department, I'm also talking about things like let's say that you're on a conference organizing committee that puts together a national conference which is a really big deal in your field, but obviously it's not doing that much when it comes to your company. Uh, let's say that it's something like serving on an editorial review board. What if you're the associate editor, let alone the editor of a journal, and you're getting paid to be able to be an editor for that journal. You have to think about these sorts of things. Even if you think you can make more money going it alone, like I said, it is usually gonna take you years until you can make the same amount of money that you would do on a side hustle like that. Uh, a lot of people, they just can't stand it, uh, especially how hard you have to work, and they end up just saying, you know what, the money's already there and it's easier insofar as its availability to get it, uh, to do one of these other side hustles, like copy editing or uh, you know, doing adjunct work on the side to be able to make extra money, whatever it happens to be, giving trainings, so on and so forth. So take that into account. And the third thing that I want you to think about is where your primary income stream is coming from. For example, maybe right now you're an academic, but you're a research professor, meaning that you get your money by submitting and working on grants. And so if that's the case, 
Think about it this way, if you're not getting more grants or you know your work on those grants with your team is not high quality enough because you're burning the, uh, the candle at both ends, right? You got both of those wicks lit. Then it's one of these things where you're not gonna get invited to be able to do more grants, to be able to serve uh, as you know, a co-investigator or a you know, co-PI or a PI on these grants. And if that happens, your primary income stream just completely went away. So these are considerations uh, that you really need to take into account before starting your company and deciding how you're going to compartmentalize these things and frankly survive. Question number four to be able to ask yourself is what is the impact going to be on my family and on my social life? Uh, you could realistically kiss your free time goodbye if you're going to start your own company. Uh, and people talk about it, and a lot of people think, well, they're exaggerating, etc. If you really want to make it work, kiss your free time goodbye. Uh, it's a trade. Everything in life is a trade. Are you willing to make this trade? And if you're not, there's nothing wrong with it. It's okay. There's a lot of ways to make money. I'll make another video for you guys, I'll put in the link below, about the best side hustles when it comes to being an academic, okay? So I'll, I'll make that for you guys so that you can see what some of those are outside of starting your own company, all right? But if you just do decide to do this, just understand what's going to happen. Make sure that your friends and family know what you're getting into and know that it's gonna be really challenging for a couple of years. If you have a partner, sit down with that partner and make sure that they're really on board with this because it is going to be stressful for them. Make sure that you talk about, you know, if you have children, you know, what's the impact going to be? How can I make sure that I'm not gonna miss those key soccer games uh, so that I'm not going to miss that key school play because I've got a conference call etc that's gonna be pretty challenging this is one of the benefits of doing things if you're single uh, or if you're particularly young there are benefits to doing that in terms of having fewer responsibilities in that regard but socially speaking as well are you gonna be able to go to brunch every Sunday are you going to be able to go to happy hour after work every day you're just not gonna be able to do it and you need to know that are you willing to make that trade and obviously, you need to be ready to uh, have a few friends, can be a really core set, two or three, uh, that you're very, very close with, who understand what's going on, and who you do carve out time for. Uh, even if other kind of ancillary friendships go by the wayside, you used to see people all the time, they weren't really close, but you know, they're enjoyable individuals, but you know, you just don't have time for them anymore. That's fair enough. That's okay. But for those core sets of friends, what my recommendation is, even if it's just a phone call, I recommend Skype, WhatsApp, etc. Carve out one hour a week. My one buddy and I, for years now, every Tuesday at 2 p.m., doesn't matter what's going on, doesn't matter if we have anything to talk about, we have that call every Tuesday at two o'clock. He's married now, he has children now, we went to grad school together forever ago it feels like, but we are very consistent because we're dedicated to being in each other's lives. We're best friends and that's what we do. And I highly recommend with your friends, obviously don't do that with your partner. Don't tell your partner or your children, listen guys, one hour a week, that's what you're getting. Uh, don't tell them that. They won't like that. You're gonna have a whole host of other problems. Uh, but for your best friends, uh, especially if they're in other countries and all, I think that's a really good strategy to use. Question number five is what are you going to monetize? Now this seems pretty obvious, right? And it could be something where there's specific kinds of research or products and services that grants in your field just don't cover. And because of that, you wouldn't normally get paid to be able to you know, make these things or to be able to conduct this research or provide these services, etc. For example, for my last company, the first thing that we developed was this monthly research digest of new articles that that were coming out in my field of forensic risk assessment. So trying to predict the likelihood of future adverse outcomes, usually criminal outcomes, usually, uh, within uh, the fields of mental health and corrections. So this was something where there was literally over 100 articles coming out a year, and because of that, the literature was so expansive that it was really hard to keep up to date with it. I struggled, and I was a researcher 24-7. I didn't really have any side hustles. And if it was hard for me, I can only imagine for clinicians, how in the world 
are they supposed to stay on top of this? And obviously one of the things that they would do is read reviews and read meta-analyses. But for those to come out in peer-reviewed journals, it literally takes years usually to be able to conduct the review, submit for peer review once you're done with everything. It takes forever to get those sorts of articles done uh, and then wait for the peer review process to get finished. The thing actually comes out in an article and then you have to disseminate it and let people know about it. And not only academics where it's easy to get a hold of them, but also clinicians where it's a lot harder to figure out who these guys are and where they are in general. So that was a real challenge for me. And so because of that, I made this research digest that every month went through, identified all of those articles that were coming out from the month to month, and really digested them into uh, a single kind of scholastic report. And that's the first thing that we ended up doing. And the reason I was passionate about it is because there were no grants that were going to pay me to do that. And I wanted to find a way to be able to monetize that work because at first I did it for free and then it was taking so much time, I just couldn't do it for free anymore. So that's one thing to take into consideration. The second thing, of course, is what skills do you already have that you can leverage? Maybe you want to make a consultation company as a lifestyle company and use a unique skill set you have. So for example, statistics statistical analysis. Maybe you're an expert in a very specific kind of statistical analysis. So for exa example, hierarchical linear modeling, for example. Fair enough, very few people know how to do HLM. You can market your services and be a consultant and get paid for that. So think about what skill sets you already have and how you can leverage those. Question number six is, will there be any backlash? This is something that people in academia really never think about when they start companies. Uh, the biggest things that I've run into is number one, people not understanding the difference between a nonprofit and a for-profit company. They think a nonprofit company is somehow inherently, you know, oh, you know, incredibly ethical and nobody gets paid anything and they're doing it out of the goodness of their hearts and these things. And it's one of these things where everybody that I've met who runs nonprofits have amazing hearts. Uh, but they're getting paid. In some cases, the executives of these nonprofits are getting paid hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. A nonprofit is a tax code issue. It has nothing to do with the quality of a company, let alone their ability to execute on things that they want to do. A uh, conference, for example, put on by a nonprofit is really no different than a conference put on by a for-profit. Uh, this is very critical to understand because people don't get it. And within academia, people are very judgmental of for-profit companies. They could say, you're selling out. This is a cash grab. You're a selfish person and you're not in academia for the right reasons and we've lost all respect for you. Uh, this can happen, hopefully amongst a minority of colleagues, but you need to expect there to be some backlash that you may never have even thought about. And they also may not understand that there are certain things like building high quality products and services that can be done much more quickly outside of academia rather than within that scope. Finally, question number seven to ask yourself is where are you going to get the money to start this business? Uh, I started my last company with $13,000, which was what I had in my bank to invest. And I literally moved back in with my parents from a six figure salary in a different country to be able to start my company. Now, obviously that worked out really well for me, but after a half decade almost of just total suffering, uh, but it worked out really well. Uh, now I know exactly what to do, and in the subsequent companies that I founded, it is a lot easier than the first go around. It's just like I have two PhDs. The first PhD that I did was one of the most difficult things I've done in my life. The second PhD was relative to the first one, a walk in the park. Still really challenging, but I knew exactly what to do. It's the same thing with business, especially if you don't have a business background going into this whole thing. Always remember that there's not never a right amount that you need in the bank to get started. Think about like YouTube videos, right? Uh, you never need the perfect equipment to be able to get started, but as you go and you start to actually make money, you can reinvest and actually do better, buy better gear, etc. And it's the same thing when it comes to starting your own company. There's never going to be a right time to be able to do this. So you need to make the decision, which would be an educated decision, but no, you're taking a big leap, whether you put $100,000 in or $10,000 in. And also, where's that money going to come from? Is it going to come from your pocket? Is it going to come from friends and family? Uh, consider seed investments. Consider going to an incubator or an accelerator. If you don't know what those are, 
Google them because you're going to find that there's a number of them wherever you're living right now and you may never have been exposed to that world of, of capital investments. And to be able to have a place that's going to provide you with your know, free legal guidance, a free mentor, free office space, for access to free resources, guidance in terms of making your actual pitches for investment in exchange, usually for some equity in your company, these things can be invaluable experiences. And so take a look at what resources are available to you. If you're in the US, take a look at for resources in your local chamber of commerce. Take into consideration certain things like, like here in Virginia, in the United States, uh, you're going to be able to get a, if you're a Virginia qualified business, you qualify for a tax cut on whatever money you're investing in a Virginia qualified company. There's certain things that you really need to find out about. Talk to local lawyers, join a local meetup.com group on entrepreneurs and find some mentors. Remember that you all always need three kinds of mentors as well. You need an old school mentor, a new school mentor, and you need, perhaps most importantly, a just out of school mentor, somebody who's younger than you are, who understands that next generation. So I'm a millennial, I would need a generation Z, or even younger than that. I would need somebody who really is kind of, you know, having their finger on the pulse of what's going on with the youth. Uh, so that you can kind of understand that because these guys oftentimes are going to be the folks that you're working with. If not now as a 1099 contractor, maybe it's something where they you know end up becoming full-time employees, maybe they're uh, volunteers of yours, etc. So that's very important is to be able to get mentors. All right, y'all, thank you so much for watching this episode. I want to hear from you in the comments below. What kind of business would you like to start? Do you want it to be a side hustle or a full-time job? Let's talk about it. Let's talk about your ideas. It'll be a lot of fun in the comments below. And as always, also let me know whether or not there are any particular topics you would like me to focus on in future episodes of Navigating Academia. And don't forget to like and share this video with your colleagues, with your friends, with your students. Subscribe to our channel and follow us on social media. If you're interested in one-on-one -on -one career counseling, especially when it comes to business, I offer executive coaching, let's take you from academia, and let's step-by-step -step get you into the world of either a private company or uh, starting something akin to a nonprofit. I can help you with these things, and I can help you not only found it, but I can help you very rapidly scale it and get past that pre-revenue stage. It's really important to have an executive coach. I would really love to do that for you because I know what you're going to go through and I can really keep you focused to be able to make sure that all that amazing energy you have is going in the right direction. So please do a consultation call with me via the website below and let's get you going. Signing off everyone, have a great day and I want you to remember to get out there, take chances and always be your best self. Thank you so much for stopping by everyone. It's a pleasure to have you here as always. If you enjoyed this video and you'd like to see more in this series on navigating academia, please click on one of these links over here to be able to view more original content. I hope to see you there.